Hi folks, here we are in Vail, Colorado. We've been working down in Navardo and I've just been sharing with the men about dreams. Jacob and Joseph, their dreams died. This is Vail. Vail is a place where many people come who have dreams to ski and to ski well. And their dreams are fulfilled in this place. And I'm wanting the church to realize that God has given every individual a dream and it's time for our dreams to come alive. Good morning, folks. It's really good to be with you. My name's Kingsley. I'm an Irishman. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. What a privilege. And particularly with, with the men. I love men's meetings. And one of the reasons is, if you look on the table, you know, it's, a, it's just pretty plain, isn't it? You know, if this was a woman's meeting, you'd have had pink ribbons and candles and little smelly things and stuff for you to take home to give to your granny and all that sort of thing, you know? Men want food, and, and as long as the food is there, you know, your, your wife might ask when you go back, what was it like, what was on the table? You don't give a hoot what was on the table. I, and I understand that, and I appreciate that. I couldn't care less what the place was like. But at least we've eaten some good food and enjoyed some time together. So it's good to be with you this morning. We are just passing through. We travel off to East Texas tomorrow, and. Uh, and this is a beautiful part of the world, went up to Estes Park yesterday and my goodness, you live in an incredible place. 300 days of sunshine. We have 300 days of rain in Ireland and it's beautiful when you can see it. When the rain stops, there's no more beautiful place in the world. It just doesn't stop very often, okay? But that's, that's the way, way it is. I want to share just a word with you this morning. Some of you will have Bibles. I don't suppose all, all of you will. It's early in the morning. If you've got your smartphone or something on there, follow through a little bit of it, of it with me. I want to share something with you that, that I, I uh, looked at actually several years ago. But I was in Tanzania a couple of weeks ago. And God brought this back to me while I was there. And that's why I'm sharing it this morning. I, a few years ago, my, my dad died in 2001. And that was, for all of us, when, when somebody in your family dies, it's a major, a major thing. No matter if you're expecting it, my dad died of a heart attack, so I wasn't expecting it. But when he died, that was a shock to the system. But my home was still in Enniskillen, in the west of, of Ireland, so I could go back to my home. My mum died in 2004. Now, when that happened, then the home was sold because there was nobody there anymore. The, the family moved away. That was a big shock to me. My mum was probably the one that I was closest to in the world, apart from my wife. And she was the one that I, wherever I travel, I travel all the time. Wherever I travel, on a Sunday night at 8 o'clock, I worked out the time difference. And I would always ring my mum. And my mum was totally unjudgmental to me. You know what I mean? There's a, somebody in your life who just loves you the way you are. And my mum was like that. So when she died in 2004, that was a real shock to my system. And I went back over, I don't know when it was, probably late 2004, and I went, I had stayed in a guest house in your hometown, strange, isn't it? <laughs> because the home was sold and there was nowhere to go, so I stayed in a, in a guest house. But I, I went to the graveyard, and when I went to the graveyard where mum and dad are buried, I don't know what it's like over here in the US, but in a local graveyard, as you walk around the headstones, the names are on the top of the headstones. I imagine it's the same here. You put the name on the headstone. And as I walked around, I recognized all the different names because it was, there were people, families, some of them well-known families from my neighborhood. And I walked around and looked at the names on the headstones. And usually what happens is you put the name on it in Ireland and then the date they were born and the date they died and then a little phrase after that. So the phrase might be a verse of scripture the most common one the day I walked around was at rest or safe in the arms of Jesus. That's one that's very common on the headstones in, in Ireland. But as I, I went there, nobody came into the graveyard. And that's unusual because graveyards are, are popular places, you know. And you don't, you don't want to hear voices there. It's not a good place to hear voices. <laughs> but I heard God. I felt God speak to, <laughs> speak to me. Thank the Lord there's nobody else there but me. But I, I really felt God speak to me. And it was a revelation that I had. And it was basically this, as I walked around and saw written on the gravestones, at rest, God started to share with me that these people that have done their job, they're, they're at rest, and it's my turn now. And I felt that very, very strongly, that I was just a link in the chain, and that there would be other people would come after me. And it was a very sobering thing, because I felt that, okay, my role is important, but I also felt that actually... I'm not the end of this. I'm not that important that God won't then pass my ministry on to somebody else. 
I went back to the guest house where I was staying, took out my Bible, and I read these verses that I'm going to share with you this morning. And I'm thinking particularly of a couple in the Bible, two boys called Manasseh and Ephraim. But I want to share with you where I start. I started in Hebrews chapter 12. You know the, the bit where it talks about the cloud of witnesses watching us. From Hebrews chapter 11. I'll actually read a few verses to you because it's good to get the Bible into us this morning. Hebrews 11. And uh, I'm not going to take a long time speaking this morning. Once I get said what I need to say, I'll stop. Hebrews 11 at the end, after it talks about the, the great heroes of faith, it says in verse 39, All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that this should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus. Now turn with me, if you have your Bible, if you haven't, just listen to, to Genesis and chapter 37. And there's a few chapters I want to just bring out a few things to you this morning. I want to talk about two, two people, eventually Manasseh and Ephraim, but before that, Jacob and Joseph. Now, in Genesis chapter 37, it talks about uh, Jacob. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Then it says, this is the history of Jacob. The next word is Joseph. Telling you the history of Jacob, it talks about Joseph. And I want to talk this morning really about who you are as a man and who I am as a man. God, I believe, made men differently from women. No matter what your president might say or anybody else might say, you were born a man and you will always be a man. I don't care what anybody else says about that. It doesn't change the fact. That's the way it is. Just accept it. If you're born, somebody else born a woman, that, that, that's fine. These guys were, were born men. You're born a man. God gave you a vision. He gave you a dream. Whether we've realized that or not, it not, does not take away from the fact that before we were born, God had laid up things that he wanted us to do. Now that for some is to go to the mission field, for some to be a preacher, for others to be a businessman, for some to be a lawyer or a teacher or an architect. That, that's between you and God, what God has guided you to do. Thank God we're not all preachers because if we're all, are all leaders here this morning because we drive each other nuts. But God has called you to do what he has called you to do. And God gave a dream to Jacob. And when you read through the, the, the Bible, you remember several dreams he gave to Jacob. Once he was, when he went away from his brother Esau, he was lying down one night at he changed the name of the place to Bethel and he had a dream of ladders going up and down to heaven. And God spoke to him on several distinct occasions. But when you read about them in the Bible, it's, it's nearly always in the Old Testament. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so God always puts people in context. So I'm Kingsley, the son of Robert John from Black Lion in, in Ireland. And that's who God is has made me. I was born at a particular time in a particular place that has shaped who I am but it gives me a context and you are the same. You're born in maybe in Colorado but you were born at a specific time to specific parents. You might not even know who your parents are. That doesn't change the fact that you were born at a specific time. And God gave Jacob dreams throughout his lifetime. And here in, in Genesis chapter 37, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, it's where Joseph, his son, has his dreams. And Joseph was his dad's favorite son. And you know the story. When he explained the dreams, the two dreams he had to his brothers, the Bible says his brothers hated him and wanted to kill him. But instead of killing him, they sold him to the Midianites. He was brought to, to Egypt. And what they did was they, they got a, a, the blood of a, a goat and they took his coat of many colors, dipped it in the blood, brought it back to his father and said, is this Joseph's coat? And at the end of, if, if you look at the verse, those of you who got a Bible, Genesis 37 verse 35, it says all his, his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, <clears throat> but he refused to be comforted and said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Jacob died that day. His dreams died. If you don't believe me, turn on to Genesis chapter 45. Look at it. Genesis chapter 40, 45. And you'll see that when he realizes his son is alive, 
It says in Genesis 45, 27, that when he had told him all the words which Joseph had said to him, when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. That's 22 years later. Jacob lived 22 years drifting, believing a lie, and he had given up the dreams that God had called him to live. Joseph is very similar. Joseph went down to Egypt. Joseph ended up in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife fancied Joseph. You know the story. He ends up in prison, and he's in prison for a few years. Eventually, the butler and the baker come in, and they, he interprets their dreams. They, the baker is hanged, butler goes back into the uh, Pharaoh and, and his, his, his wine taster once again. But eventually Pharaoh has dreams and the butler remembers that there was a guy in prison that interpreted his dreams. They bring him out, he becomes the prime minister of the land. Now Joseph had dreams that God gave to him when he was 17 years old. And his dreams were this, that his brother's household, the whole household and his brothers would bow down to him. He lived that dream, it became part of his life. But I want you just to think about this this morning. Genesis chapter 41, for those of you who have it, and verse 51 and 52. In Genesis chapter 41, he's, he's made the prime minister of the land. He is second in command to Pharaoh. He marries an Egyptian lady and everything is going well for him. And so he reasons out in his mind this is where God wants me to be. Now I want to suggest to you this morning that Jacob and Joseph became selfish men because they lived for themselves. Jacob said, I'm going to go down to the grave in mourning because Joseph is dead. 22 years his life stopped. Joseph came into a new land and he decided that he would put his dreams behind him. How do I know that? Well, look at Genesis 40, 41 verse 51. Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. Manasseh means to forget. And he says, I'm calling him Manasseh because God has made me forget all my toil and all of my father's house. Do you see that? God has made me forget my father's house. Now his dreams were that his brothers, his father's house, would bow down to him. That was the dream. So to fulfill his dream, his brothers had to come and they had to bow down to him. But he's in a new land. And so his logic and his reason is saying, hey, I've had a pretty junky life up to this point. Now God has turned it around. This is the way it is. And I'm going to make the best of where it is. But my, I, my dreams, I'm going to put them in the background. They will never be fulfilled. They can never be fulfilled because I will never see my brothers again. So I'll call my first son Manasseh, which means to forget my father's household. And then he called his second son, verse 52, Ephraim, because God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now we know looking back that the reason that God chose Joseph to go down into Egypt was to preserve the people of God, to preserve the Israelites because they would have food during the famine. But God never wanted him to stay there in Egypt. He was going to bring him back out again. But he as a man, he decided that I'm going to work this all out myself. My dreams are better. And I just want to show you what God did if you, you follow with me. Genesis chapter 42, the brothers come in to the, the, uh, the land of Egypt. Verse, eight of, or verse 7 of Genesis 42, when his brothers come in, it says, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them and acted harshly towards them. When the brothers came in, Joseph got angry. Why did he get angry? He got angry because God would not allow the dreams to die. He got angry because God came back in with a challenge and said, Hey, you're not living for yourself. This is not about you. It's about your father. It's about you. It's about the children after you. The dream that God gave him wasn't for himself. And so I want to suggest to you this morning 
that what God spoke to me in the graveyard was this. This has got nothing to do with you, Kingsley. It's got to do with the people that you will minister to, the people that you will have an effect on. It's your dream, but it's not for you. It's for the people I will send you to. And that's important for us to realize that. You don't exist for yourself. So the choices that we make that we think only involve us and our family, not so. You were called to have a position of influence. And the decisions that you make will not just affect you. So God brought his brothers back. And it says in verse 8 of Genesis 42, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And everything's good until verse 9. It says in verse 9 of Genesis 42, Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. Basically what's happening here is Joseph, he, he's really ticked off with God here. I believe. This is my interpretation of it. God's brought the brothers back. He recognizes them. And he remembers those wretched dreams that got him into all the trouble he was in anyway. But he's got Manasseh when he goes home at night sitting there. It's okay, Dad, I forget. You can forget your dreams. But he can't because the brothers are facing him. And every time he comes up and sees them, the brothers are facing him. And they bow down to him. And he remembers his dreams. He doesn't want to remember them. Because his dreams bring him pain. But he remembers his responsibility. Now, I have to take, me, take you on to Jacob. Chapter 46. What happens, and I'm skipping the story here. What happens in this situation is that uh, he reveals himself to his brothers. There's restoration. He asks, is my dad still alive? And so they go, they tell him that his dad's still alive. His dad's spirit revives within him. And God speaks to him and says, go down to Egypt. But look at chapter 46. It says, Jacob took his journey with all that he had, came to Beersheba, offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. He said, I am, I am God, the God of your father. He's putting them back into context. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. That's Genesis 40, 46. I will bring you down. Then if you look on to Genesis 40, chapter 48, God speaks to Jacob down in Egypt. And he says in verse 4, Behold, I will make you fruitful and will multiply you. I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. God said to him, I will make you fruitful. Now, Joseph has named his boys forgetfulness and fruitfulness. Forgetfulness because I'm going to put all this dream of God behind me. I'm going to live on to myself. I'm going to live the American dream the way that I want to live it. To part with everybody else. I'm going to put this, the context is me and my family and doing the best that I can. So Manasseh, I'm going to forget everything else and I'm going to focus on my family. God says, I'm going to bring you down to Egypt and I will make you fruitful there. So when he meets his grandchildren, one of them is forgetfulness, one of them is fruitfulness. God says, I'm going to make you fruitful. So I guess when he goes down, he sees fruitfulness and thinks, hey, that's what God spoke to me. Fruitful there. Now stay with me. Genesis chapter 48. Jacob's about to bless Joseph's sons. God says, I'm going to make you fruitful. Make a multitude of your people. Verse 5, Jacob bring, Joseph brings his sons to, to Jacob. In verse 5, he says, Your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon are mine. And then he says in verse 7, As for me, when I came from Paddan, Rachel died beside me, in Canaan on the way. I love this story, just to throw it in here. When, when Rachel died, Rachel was in such pain, she named her son Benoni, which means son of my trouble. And immediately Jacob stopped her and said, no, 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 no. Even as she's dying, no son of mine is going to be called son of my trouble. I'm going to call him son of my right hand. The importance of the right hand, Benjamin. That's what it means, son of my right hand. So he calls Joseph and he says, uh, bring, me, bring me your sons. And so Joseph brings the sons. Look at verse 13. Joseph took 
his sons Ephraim with his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his hands, and of course he stretched, now listen, watch this here. He's stretching out his hands towards Manasseh and Ephraim, and Joseph's brought his kids in. And the right hand is the hand of blessing, not the left hand. The right hand is the one that goes to the firstborn. The right hand is the one that carries the anointing of God. Jesus came and stood at the right hand of the Father. So the right hand, Benjamin, son of my right hand. So as Jacob stretched out his, his right hand, Joseph brings Manasseh to his right hand. And basically what he's saying is, Father, I want you to realize this is a new land we've come to. I've made my own dream. I've made my, this is the land of my dreams. I want your blessing to come on my forgetfulness so that we can put this all. You've now moved to my land. This is my land. I want you to bless the forgetfulness in my life. Dad, we're going to put this all behind us. Forget the famine in Canaan. Forget where we've come from. I want you to put your hand of blessing on forgetfulness. That's what Joseph's doing. But what happens with Jacob, you can read it there, is he crosses his hands. And the Bible says he's short of sight. But there's a little phrase that won't let us away with that. Because in verse 14, Israel stretched out his right hand, laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger. And his left hand on Manasseh's head. And says a little phrase there, guiding his hands knowingly. That's in verse 14 of Genesis 48. And so he speaks blessing over fruitfulness. And Joseph gets really annoyed. Joseph's angry. You can see that in verse 17. Joseph saw that his father Abraham laid his right hand on the head of Abraham. It displeased him. So he took his hands to shove them. And in verse 18, Joseph, Joseph said to his father, No, no, this is the firstborn. But his father refused in verse 19 and said, I know my son, I know he also shall become a people. He also shall be great, but truly his younger son, fruitfulness, shall be greater than forgetfulness. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by, by you Israel will bless, saying, may God make you as fruitfulness and forgetfulness. And thus he set fruitfulness before forgetfulness. Do you know, that's for me an amazing story. Where God brought the dreams of two men who had sacrificed their dreams and said it doesn't matter anymore. Circumstances had told them you're too old, you're too sick, you're too poor, you're not qualified well enough. All those things that are thrown at us today. But God says, no, I've given you a dream and I will make you fruitful. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so God changed it around and made Joseph fruitful instead of forgetfulness. And did it work well? Later on, Jacob is blessing his sons. And in Genesis 49 verse 22, he prophesies over Joseph and says, Joseph, not as a forgetful vine, but Joseph is a fruitful vine. And the last thing Joseph does before he dies is he calls his brothers in. I, I don't know if he, it looks like he died first, but he calls his brothers in and their families and says, Listen guys, I want you to do something for me. And I want you to promise you will do this for me before I die. When I die and you leave this place as you will, I want you to take my bones and I want you to carry them with you back to the land of Canaan. And that was the final sign that Joseph, his dreams had revived. He says, I wasn't born to die in Egypt. I was born to die in the land of Canaan because that's the promised land. Now, when I was in the graveyard, just to pull this together, I felt incredibly challenged by God. That God, two things. One is, hey, this is your turn, so I want you to step up to the plate, and I want you to take the responsibility. These people that are left here, that are at rest, they've done their job. Many of them had prayed for me. I recognized the name. I knew the families from church particularly. Many of them would have prayed for me, but they're dead now. It's your turn. You're going to rise up. You're going to take the baton, and you're going to run with it. But it isn't you that's going to finish it. One day, you will hand it on to somebody else, and you are one part in the overall dream of reconciling the world to God as Christ did on the cross. So this morning, as men here in this place, I want to ask you a question. What is your dream? What is the dream God has given 
to you. It may be a business dream. Praise God if it is. It might be as a teacher or it might be as a pastor or an evangelist or a, or a missions. All I'm saying is this. Don't sell your dream. Even if you're paid billions, don't sell your dream for God's second best. Because that's what Joseph did. Because his reasoning said this dream can never work because of the way I've been treated through my life. But God brought it all around and made sure his brothers came to the place where the dream could be fulfilled. And I want to encourage you as men. This is an amazing place. What a fantastic church. What a fantastic place to belong to. I know there are some of you visiting from other churches. I'm sure your church is a fantastic place. This is not my church. It's your place. Colorado's your place. Listen, I've been, I was in John Wesley's down in Bristol just a few weeks ago and, and he said, the world is my parish. That's what I like. The world is my parish. So I go to a new country. I was an in, insignificant little teenager who God put his hands on. I would go red. My face would go red if I stood in front of three people. My mom used to know the Methodist minister and he'd say, would Kingsley read a lesson? And she, she always said yes. She couldn't say no to him. I wouldn't have slept for a fortnight before I had to to stand up in front of everybody but God took a hold of me and changed my life and gave me a dream of, of working with him to reconcile the world to himself and I just want to finish there and I'm going to pray and say to you this morning don't allow the blessing of Egypt to sacrifice your dream because God will bring the brothers back and he will remind you you might get angry when he does but when God reminds you of your dream, just remember he has called you to be fruitful. Maybe in the land of your suffering right now, but he has called you to be fruitful, not to be forgetful. Father, I thank you this morning for a, a great time in your presence. Thank you for the fellowship together, one with another. Thank you, Lord, as men. Thank you that we're different from the women. Lord, there's time when the women are great, but it's good just to get away from them every now and again. Thank you for this morning, for the food we've eaten, for the fellowship. Thank you for the word of God that speaks to men today. Thank you for Jacob and for Joseph that you revived the dreams in our heart. Lord, I thank you for every dream here. I thank you for the many, many men in this place this morning who are right in the center of fulfilling your dream for their lives. And I thank you for that. Lord, if there are those whose dreams have died or have faded and have gone dim, then Lord, I pray this morning, then look, would you pour your fire into their dream. Would you, Lord, revive it once again so their bones won't be resting in a place where you don't want them to be. Lord, I pray, I speak fruitfulness over your men in this place this morning that they would not forget the dream but remember what you've spoken to them and cause them to be a fruitful vine as they leave this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kingsley. Thank you guys for being here this, um, this morning. Um, you know, as Kingsley was sharing, I, I was thinking there, there were levels of, of dreams and there were levels of, of things that God calls us to. We have our individual dreams that God speaks to us. And what he said really resonated with, don't allow the blessing of Egypt, the comfortability of that we, which we seek and we, in, in our flesh we, we desire, don't allow that to rob you from your from your destiny and your purpose as a man in our lives but that's our individual then the other side is us as a church my friends I believe God has a dream for us yeah. as a church yeah. and it's greater than what it has been and our future is bright and you are a part of the destiny of God for us as we are a family this is, we're not people who gather, we're a family. I need you, and whether you like it or not, you need me. And together, we are better, we are stronger, and we are more significant. Because God has set before us a dream. And I'm going to go to my grave, believing and embracing and seeing that dream fulfilled in our lives. And that's for us today. So men, may we leave here today with that challenge. We wouldn't allow anything to rob us from the dream that God's put in your heart. For you as an individual, 
but for us as a church, it's great and it's wonderful.